And here we look at two motion, two dimensions. Can I increase the motion here? I can increase the volume. So if I slowly increase the volume, this now is what's happening in a normal gas. You have millions of little bubbles inside there. That guy would be connected to a dial. So if I was to increase the volume, I bring that guy up a little bit, what do you think would happen to pressure? Increase. It would be because? Because they're not bouncing as many times. Yeah, there's less of these guys hitting off the surface there than there was before. So that in turn is connected, let's say, to a dial. So down here, if it was all the way down at the bottom, that dial would be turned, would be, it, it, there'd be a lot of pressure on that, pressure being the molecular motion, and that would be causing a dial to turn. Whereas if it's all the way up at the top, there's very little pressure, and therefore the dial goes back to its default position. And we let's go halfway down, and we'll take a look at temperature. If you now start increasing temperature, what's going to happen? And as a result, as a result, the pressure goes up because you're getting more you're getting more collisions per second, right? And uh, and that's why we have to keep the temperature constant. You could change the number of molecules. I think that you can also show the path taken by one molecule. This guy here, obviously, the guy is bouncing around all over the place. And it's almost random motion. Right? The little uh, line there just follows that up. Okay? We'll take that up to one third one. Actually, this guy here is just the experiment for doing himself. This was done by Robert Boyle. Uh, an Irishman who came from Waterford. It's a strange think, question as to whether you call this guy Irish or not. He didn't consider himself to be Irish. In fact, he used a phrase, or it's a bit like a phrase used by a guy called Wellington. What did he say about being Irish? He was which? He was more English than English. He's, well, he certainly considered himself to be an Englishman, but yet he was born in Ireland. So people said, I'm you an Irishman because you were born in Ireland. And his phrase was, if I was born in a stable, would it have made me a horse? Right? So the guy was not too proud of being born in Irish. Uh, Boyle went pretty much the same. Born down in Waterford. In fact, he's, he was the, his father was the Earl of Cork. And so, so he was a pretty important guy, and all the big scientists back then were pretty rich because they had to support themselves. Right? So he's sometimes called, because, because his work was so fundamental, he's often referred to as the father of chemistry. So he said he's the father of chemistry and he's the son of the Earl of Cork. But these are, it's just a page taken from one of his diaries where he did, where he did his uh, calculations, wrote up the results, and it, pretty much the stuff hasn't changed in 400 years. It's 400 years ago. He wrote up his results. He's got different numbers here. This is his instructions, the height of the mercury cylinder that counterbalanced the something of the atmosphere, the pressure of the atmosphere. That's what column C corresponds to. And down here then, what I think is interesting here, you know these precautions and sources of error? Yeah. He's got three or four or five of these guys down here. It's very hard to read it. Uh, something lower, the crooked part of the pipe was placed in a square wooden box of a good largesse and depth to prevent the volume of quicksilver that might fall along in the transfusion from the vessel. I don't know what it means, but basically it's a whole lot <laughs> Number three, that we were two, that we were two to make the observations together. The one to take notice at the bottom uh, that the quicksilver rose in the something cylinder, in the sharper cylinder, and the other to pour in at the top of the longer, it being hard and cumbersome, for one man alone to do both acts. Quicksilver, right? Quicksilver, yes, yeah, fancy word, the old fashioned word. Right. So again, pretty much the same form of writing it up that we used to do. Sorry? I would imagine so, yes. I would imagine that, right? It certainly is. Uh, where are we going with that? We're looking at Boyle's Law. Here we go. This is one of the things that we did this before. I think we only get five minutes on it. So we're going to try and make the maximum use of the five minutes. There are all different types of equipment you can use to verify Boyle's Law. This is one form. It's the picture you will see in the textbook. Again, what you're looking at is a gas. What you're hoping to see is a gas. You've got to measure the volume of the gas and the pressure of the gas. One of the reasons I don't like this guy is because you've got a liquid down here and you've got a scale and students often think that it's the volume of the liquid that you're measuring. Where in actual fact it's the volume of and where is the gas? <coughs> yeah, it's a bit you can't see, it's a bit on top of the liquid. So it's a, it's a little bit misleading. And here then is the pressure barometer. So the more pressure there is, and you increase the pressure by attaching this to a pump, right? The more pressure there is, the more molecules per second there are uh, in here. 
right? Because that's really what you're measuring. So the number of molecules per second bouncing off the surface here. But because all the pressure is connected in the liquid, is the same as the pressure there, is the same as there's oil down here, because they're all actually at the same pressure. This, this pressure, molecular motion transmits itself to all the liquid and the fluid the same. Whatever reading you get there corresponding to the oil also corresponds to the pressure that is here. In fact, one of the reasons that might seem slightly incorrect is that we show that pressure increases with depth. So the pressure at the bottom should be slightly different than the pressure at the top. But the difference there is so slight that we ignore it. Anyway, like I said, it's fairly cumbersome. Plus the pump doesn't work or the valve doesn't work. So I had to replace it. And I did say, as soon as I put that up, we have to maximize the five minutes and then I walk away from it. Right, here we go again. In this case, there's our molecular motion. I like this as opposed to the real experiment because you can see the molecules moving here. So you keep track of time, which is up there, and now down to three minutes. I can take one of these guys, if I say restart, reset, okay, there we go. If I take one of these guys here, what's going to happen to the volume? What's going to happen to pressure? It's going to go up. So if you had a graph of pressure against volume and you recorded it, you get a point there, right? If you then take a second one of these and pump it on there, volume has gone, pressure has gone. What's going to happen here? What's going to happen to pressure? It's increased. So it's up there somewhere on the volume? No, Increase or decrease? decrease. So am I going to be to the right of that or to the left? Left. left. Record it. And there you are. And one of the things we'd like to see here is that we get a nice straight line. So I record again and go two or three more times. Record again. And what that shows me is that as pressure is going up, it looks like the volume is decreasing. And you record all of those. You don't get a straight line. Well, here's, the, here's again, one of the things we haven't really spoken about yet. You would think that you've got to get a straight line between pressure and volume, but you don't. What you actually get to show that something is inversely proportional to something else, and that's pretty much all we need to do here. We could take a look at other bits and pieces, but that'll do for now. To show you that one concept like pressure is inversely proportional to another concept like volume, you put pressure on one axis, and to try and get a straight line, what might you do? Want to guess? If it's inversely proportional to something else, pressure, something is going to give us a straight line like that. It turns out what this axis is. Not by minus one. One over the V. So now if you put pressure on one axis and one over volume on the other axis, if one is inversely proportional to the other, you get a straight line like that. Okay? I highlight this because quite often on an exam, you will get data for pressure and volume. And so often people think they just have to plot. They'll plot pressure and they'll plot volume and they'll get this. And what do they do then? They draw a straight line down there and they say, we've got a straight line, therefore that shows pressure is in perfect volume. It is actually a curve. If you continue this the whole way along, you'd actually get a curve like that. Just mathematically, that's just the way it works out. Right? So if you want to show that something's inversely proportional to something else, pressure and one over volume like that. Okay, so let's do the real experiment here. We test it nice and quickly. How are we doing on time there? Does it give us enough time left on the table? Uh, no, no? We're 28 okay. minutes on the battery. We work away. Nice and quickly here. Uh, I have a valve down here at the bottom. In fact, you can turn that off because I think I have this on a separate table.